Now let's take a look at the third type of Roman architecture. Um, oh, uh, actually the fourth type, the thermi. That is the Roman bath. Um, you know, the Romans had an emperor, but the Roman emperor was very different from, say, the emperor of China. Um, you know, the emperor of China very often had great authority, unchallenged authority. All the rest of the officials and the people were like their servants. Roman emperors were different. Um, the Roman, even though they had an emperor, they also had senate. Um, the, the emperor um, didn't have as great an authority as the Chinese emperor. They need to please his army, his general, and even his citizens in the city of Rome <laughs> um, <clears throat> to get their support. Um, and um, to some extent, all those conquests was to bring wealth to Rome to, to make a, a good claim that the emperor is, is a good emperor and can provide comfortable life to, to the citizen, to the Romans. So he needs to basically to, to gain their support in order to, to, be, um, to be in office. And there was very often, you know, that the emperors were deposed by their own general, their own armies, and their own people. Building thermi was a way to win the heart of Roman citizen, basically. It enhanced Roman emperor's power over the mass. And the Romans, as long as they have comfortable life, they support their emperor. And, um, and then, you know, the, the emperor needed to, to bring wealth to, to Rome um, and um, constant conquest would certainly do, do the trick. So those wealth went into the construction of those uh, major monument in the city of Rome and each emperor left a, um, a major bath, major Roman bath, a major theater, and uh, um, a forum. That is a architectural uh, form we will look at slightly later. So these Roman bath was big complexes that include libraries, museums, shops, gardens, massage room, gymnasium, and different kind of bath. So they were complicated structure. We will look at the bath of Caracalla. Um, this Caracalla is a Roman emperor. Um, <clears throat> and we also talked about that, you know, the Greeks had a democracy while the Romans had an imperial um, governance. However, that doesn't mean the, the, the Roman society was worse than the uh, Greek society. For example, in terms of gender equality, the Romans did much better than the Greeks. In, under the Greek democracy, women didn't have the right to vote and women didn't have much chance to participate in public affair. But in Roman society, under an emperor, their women enjoyed much greater freedom. They can go to the bath, they can go to the amphitheater to watch those bloody fighting, gladiatorical fighting. And this kind of Roman mosaic shows a very modern image showing two ladies playing balls dressed in bikini. Um, so obviously that is in, in a Roman bath, right? So this is, they are having sport in a, in a thermite. Um, and we also know there were powerful women 
in Roman history that were rulers. And that is pretty much unheard in the Greek history, right? Like Livia, um, the wife of Augustus, she was very powerful. Um, she certainly enjoyed a lot of um, a lot of authority in the imperial order. So um, sometimes, you know, democracy, imperial, that those just a word itself does not represent everything. We have to look into how life actually operate under those systems of big words. Um, the Bath of Caracalla, a huge complex, include a court courtyard enclosed by libraries and, um, um, and other facilities. And then in the middle, that is the main bath um, complex. The bath had two entrances, one for women, one for men, and a two sides of sport facility, one for women, one for men. And then in the center, that is pretty much for men. Um, that is the bath, the bath, the major, the central bath along the central axis. So, so along the central axis, from the entrance side, in the middle, it was the natatio, that is the plunging pool. Let's see, yeah, plunging pool, that one, called natatio. And um, so we are looking at that space, you know, men and women's facility on each side, but the central space were still pretty much, um, you know, men occupied. Uh, the first main bath space was called the frigidario, frigidarium, that is a cold, cold water bath. And um, um, then the next one is called tepidarium, that is the uh, warm bath hall. And then the last one, which is a, um, cylinder building covered by a dome. Um, and that is the caudarium, right? The caudarium building, that building, um, which is the hot water. So water of different temperature. The facility was heated from underground, from below. And um, the heating from below were also kind of a tunneled, not only to different space, but also behind the wall. So their wall contained the space for the passing of those hot airs to warm up the interior, the entire space. Um, the floor was suspended and um, the hot water was delivered with pipes behind the marble veneer. So Roman architecture, unlike Greek architecture, which is basically a big sculpture, Roman architecture had its internal operating system. It has a sophisticated sewage system, sophisticated heat distribution system, water supply, um, it is just more architectural, right? It's not, not just a giant uh, sculpted piece of artwork. It's the Greek architecture. It's very complicated. So some ruins expose those underground uh, space uh, for heating and those tunnels for distributing the heat and water. Now, Let's take a look at uh, the Roman residential architecture. In the city of Rome, well-to-do family live in domus. Domus was nice um, urban house, urban you know individual building for you know a single family household with an atrium. Right? So this domus is characterized by, again, a linear design with a center and a two sides. 
the center has a series of public space. And in the front is a courtyard called atrium. That's the atrium. Um, the open side to the street, um, the in entrance to the household is often from the center. And then the side rooms not connected with the other rooms of the household are usually opened as a shop. There were also front shop that could be rent out to make some, you know, uh, income for the household. So the first of this series of central space, the first one is called atrium. It is a place, of course, for light, for um, ventilation, and uh, but it's not a space for activity because in the middle it is basically a sink um, to collect the rain water from above. So it's purely a kind of a light and um, ventilation um, opening in the ceiling. And that is the, um, the atrium. The next, yeah, here, the atrium, all right. The floor is um, sunk to receive the, the rain water. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so all the rooms open to, to that space to get light and get good air. Um, the exterior wall of Roman um, domus was also kind of windowless. The next space is called the tablinum. Tablinum is like the central uh, ritual center of the household, also the business center, the ritual center for public affair. Um, this is the space um, for the master of the house to conduct business, it's like his office, to oversee the coming and going into the house. It also uh, exhibit the bust of the owner, the death mask of the ancestor. So it's like the shrine of the household. So that's that kind of ceremonial center and a business center for the household. Semi-public. It often has a screen behind it to give some privacy to the rear of the household, which is more private, right? That area. Behind the tablinum is the most private area of the household. Um, that private area centered around a garden. And uh, the garden often has a peristyle porch called peristylum, refer to that space. It's basically a peristyle court, right? With columns all around, featuring a fountain in the middle and um, uh, trees and um, uh, water surfaces, plants, uh, grass. So the kind of internal green, green area known as peristylum. So around this space, there were dining rooms. There were also um, sleeping chambers and those private chambers. Um, two dining rooms called triclinium. One for winter, which is just next to the tablinum, and one for summer, which is more open to um, the, the peristylum, right? Unlike the Greek andron, the Roman triglanium served both sex. Again, um, we see the greater gender equality uh, in the Roman society. And the Romans, uh, like the Greeks, recline on on a, on, a, on a seat. Um, to, and they were um, highly decorated with, with painting, mosaic, and a floor decoration as well. Uh, but of course, that was for well-to-do family. Um, there were also the so-called insulae, and the insulae 
were like apartment building, um, urban apartment building. And there were villas. Villas are outside the city in the rural area, but we are not going to look into the detail of those uh, apartment insulate or the villa um, from the Roman, Roman uh, part. Now let's next, let's take a look at the Roman planning. We looked at the um, Greek planning, the Roman planning. It's all developed and colonized. Was it grow from a small settlement and into a big city? Um, so very irregular. But the planned Roman city, like the planned Greek city, um, was very regular. And the Romans especially use a method called centriation for the design of their colony city. Um, centriation. Centriation, you know, now we have century, that means a hundred year. But in Latin, century um, simply means a hundred, right? It could be a hundred of anything. So centriation simply refer to a hundred and it's originally a term referring to the dividing of the land into a hundred equal lots. The logic of planning resembles military organization of the Roman legion. Um, the, the Roman legion had a century, which, which is, you know, a uh, hundred uh, infantry. And then, you know, um, a certain number of century uh, makes the upper level uh, military division. And indeed, those Centration cities, those colonies, are often founded for the veteran soldiers as the pension for their service. Say a Roman legion conquered North Africa, part of North Africa, then a centration city could be constructed there so that those soldiers could just stay there, station there, and um, uh, live a comfortable um, retired life um, in that city built specifically for them. So these centration cities were organized um, also kind of like a military camp. However, they had all the necessary architectural facility to make a Roman style civilized life. And that include theater, include temple, include amphitheater, and uh, um, most importantly, a bath, a thermi, you know, for their entertainment and enjoyment. So these cities were divided like the Greek um, colonial city into different blocks by street and avenues, centration uh, street, uh, cities, especially has a north-south cardinal that is north-south thoroughfare, sometimes goes all the way through the city, sometimes stopped at the public civic building. And then there is a decumanus, which is referred to the east-west main thoroughfare, dividing the city into four quarters and each quarter further divided into smaller blocks. And at the end of the Cardo and um, Decumanus are trifle arches serving as a ceremonial gate um, for these cities. So Roman arch, which is another architectural type we will look at later. Those civic centers are usually located in the location where, you know, different part of the city had equal access. So here we have a, we have a theater and um, uh, a basilica, right? That is the uh, administration and court building, a forum for gathering, another basilica for different administration purposes, and a thermi, a couple thermi 
at different location uh, to serve different part of the um, of the city and within the um, um, the forum there is a temple there's always a temple in a in the forum so what is forum uh, the previous city by the way is the uh, a, a Roman city called team God located in um, today's Algeria in North Africa now let's take a look another very important Roman architectural form or urban form called the Forum. The Forum, we are looking at the Forum of Pompeii. Pompeii, a city buried under the eruption of Vesuvius, Mount Vesuvius. Um, the eruption, the whole city was killed um, by that eruption, but preserved a perfectly a Roman city intact to the modern age. Uh, to be recovered by archaeologists, right? Um, the Roman Forum is like the Greek Agora. Greek Agora uh, was a civic square, so is Roman Forum. But a major difference is the Roman Forum is much ordered than the Greek Agora. The space is much more contained, closed up, the entrance and exit more controlled and architecture more symmetrical and axial. Um, the main axis terminate at a temple, right? So this is the forum and there we have a temple and that temple much like Mason Carey um, at Nîmes in France is um, peristyle in appearance and um, um, you know, pro style in reality, in spatial reality, um, and the whole closed space was um, enclosed by a peristyle, so columns circulate the entire um, courtyard space, and it was closed to to through traffic. Uh, traffic um, people were not allowed to drive a um you know chariot into into that space that's the main kind of civic space but also used for um you know ceremonial purposes the romans also constructed so i'm going to complete this one this should be very short um also construct you know th these um aqueduct all right aqueduct to brought water to the city to feed the fountains um R roman engineers were were quite precise um so the romans were great engineers they built they built tunnels bridges and siphons for overcoming the natural barriers to bring water to the city the slope of their aqueduct is standardized as one foot per three thousand feet so to bring water to the city it has to, um, the slope had to be stable, right? From the water source, from the mountain in the suburb and going to the city in the lower land. So that aqueduct maintained a very stable sloping down, overcoming long distance all, and all kinds of natural barriers to bring water to the city. This section, is at Pont du Gard, also in, in uh, southern France. And it has multi layers. Um, so the lower part uh, double as a footbridge, and the top is to bring water. So even in architecture like this, the Romans use the pro proportion they prefer, right? Square. And uh, this illustration shows how to build a arch. Um, you need the wooden framework called a centering, right? You need this centering. And uh, to lay bricks or stones one on top of the other until you lay the last top central piece of block, you 
cannot dismantle the centering. Otherwise, it will collapse. So that stone became known as a keystone. The keystone, right? Because that's the last stone to put on to stabilize. After you put the keystone, the arch is self-sustaining. And you build a series of arches, one behind the other, you create a barrel vault. But you need um, a wooden centering. So, all right. Um, I think, you know, we are going to stop here. And um, 